Hello historians, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Prof. J. I am your history professor. Today's lesson is going to be all about the Roman Empire. We'll begin our look at the empire with the reign of the first emperor, Augustus, who we met in the last presentation. The main theme of Augustus's reign is the centralization of power, meaning he gathered more power into his own hands at the expense of those people and institutions that formerly had power in the old Roman Republic. We'll also do a brief survey of the groups of emperors that came after Augustus and how they continued that centralization project during their respective reigns. We'll also dive into the second of the monotheistic faiths we'll be examining, Christianity. We'll begin by examining the larger Roman and Jewish contexts of Christianity. Then we'll move on to what important early figures like Jesus and Paul contributed to the faith before looking at the growth of Christianity in the first few centuries CE. We'll also explore the process of Romanization, or the spread of Roman culture to all corners of the empire, as well as the role that literature, the law, the army, and cities played in the spread of Roman culture. Lastly, for this presentation, we'll take a brief look at society during the Roman Empire, beginning with the social classes Rome divided into under the reign of Augustus and ending with the role of women and slavery in the empire. Without further ado, it's time for history, so let's get started. Hello historians, and welcome to History 101. Today's lesson will focus on the Roman Empire. For my current students, as always, there's a forum that accompanies this video located in the Roman Empire module in our course LMS. If you haven't accessed that forum, please do so now. For any non-students who may be watching this video, welcome! I hope that you like what you're about to see, and more importantly, I hope you learn something about the Roman Empire. Now that I've given my students enough time to access the forum, on to the Empire. Recall that at the end of Unit 5's lesson on the Roman Republic, Octavian, Julius Caesar's grandnephew and adopted heir, defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra in battle to become the sole ruler of the Roman world. Recall also that in 27 BCE, the Senate granted Octavian the title Augustus, and he effectively became the first Roman Emperor. The next few decades, known as the Augustan Age, would see an important pattern that would mark the political development of the Roman Empire. During Augustus's long reign, he steadily gathered more power into his own hands at the expense of other state organs, particularly the Senate. A second trend that would last until the second half of the first century was that Augustus disguised this accumulation of power with the trappings of republicanism. That is, he maintained the fiction that he was returning Rome to the height of the Republic, while in reality, he was doing quite the opposite. Augustus ruled Rome with an aristocratic senate, whose decrees held the force of law, but were approved by Augustus ahead of time. A new bureaucracy came into being to train the army, completing the professionalization of it begun under Marius. The army was used to defend Rome's vast frontiers and for maintaining internal order. The army was composed of two different groups. The regular legionaries organized into legions appropriately, and the auxiliaries. The first were 150,000 Roman citizens who served 20-year terms, while the second were non-citizens and foreign troops placed under Roman commanders. The auxiliaries numbered 130,000 and served 24-year terms, with Roman citizenship as a reward at the end. Augustus claimed the power to appoint leaders of certain provinces of the empire, and while the Senate nominally had the power to appoint the remaining leaders, its choice could be overruled by Augustus. Rome ruled such a vast territory by working with local elites, normally located in cities and towns. These officials followed Rome's orders and kept the peace in return for Roman citizenship. 
This essentially made cities and towns the smallest political unit in the empire. Augustus held the position of consul for the first few years of his reign in order to hold imperium. Later on, however, he stopped running for consul but was awarded Maius Imperium, a greater form of power that he held for the rest of his life, and in 23 BCE was granted the powers of a tribune of the plebes without actually holding that office. He therefore held not only greater authority than any other official in Roman government, but he was also able to lead armies and could veto measures discussed by the Senate. This concentration of power gave the lie to his claims to want to bring back the glory days of the Republic. Speaking of leading armies, Augustus did expand Roman control to new areas early in his reign, but disasters in Germany caused him to rethink his strategy. He began to believe that Rome was overextended and that a policy of defending what it already had rather than try to take more was needed. Most other emperors would follow this pattern of consolidation, with a few exceptions. Now that we've finished the first section for today's lesson, let's take a moment to review. First, the reign of Augustus marked the beginning of a pattern in which emperors steadily gained more power into their own hands at the expense of others. Second, the Roman army under Augustus was composed of 150,000 regular troops and 130,000 auxiliaries. Lastly, cities and towns were the smallest political units in the empire and were used to manage large tracts of land. Augustus died in 14 CE, and the next four emperors were either related to Augustus or to his wife. They became known as the Julio-Claudians, and included Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. The four ruled from 14 to 68 CE and continued the process of consolidating power by removing even more power from the Senate and creating another bureaucracy to handle many of the affairs the Senate used to take care of. The next group of rulers were known as the Flavians, who ruled from 69 to 96 CE. They came to power in 69 with Vespasian, who ended a brief civil war. The Flavians clearly demonstrated an important truth about the empire, that being the role of the army in creating new emperors. It was the Flavian rulers who shed the facade of republicanism and began using the title emperor openly. 96 to 180 CE saw the reigns of the five good emperors. Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. During this period of 84 years, the empire was stable, prosperous, and relatively peaceful. The first four of these men had no children, so they adopted men to be their heirs and inherit the empire. This practice helped lend stability and prevent wars over who would rule Rome. Imperial officials under the five good emperors continued to take over government functions, and the power of the emperor expanded into new areas. For example, Trajan created a program to aid poor Romans in educating their children. The success Rome was having during the first two centuries, a time known as the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, could not have happened without economic growth. Trade flourished during this time, as grain and numerous luxury items were sent to Rome, and gold and silver left Rome for the provinces. Trade was even established, albeit indirectly, with the Chinese Han Dynasty via the routes that made up the Silk Road. The growth of trade led to a growth in industry to fill the demand for products. Agriculture was still the biggest game in town, however and employed more people than any other activity. Enslaved people were still used on Latifundia, just as they were during the years of the Republic. But those landed estates were also worked by colonai, or sharecroppers who were free people that paid a form of rent for the land they worked. The prosperity, however, was not evenly distributed. 
a huge gap existed between the rich and the poor. Wealthy Romans made their wealth off of the backs of a large number of poor Romans who worked in fields, mines, and as domestic servants, sharing little in the riches. I think this is a good place to rest and review the previous section. First, after Augustus, emperors tended to be grouped together. For example, the Julio-Claudians, the Flavians, and the Five Good Emperors. Second, a healthy economy and robust trade helped establish the period of the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, of the first two centuries CE. Lastly, wealth was not evenly distributed throughout the empire, meaning a large gap existed between the rich and the poor. The good times did not last forever. Marcus Aurelius, last of the five good emperors, was the only one to have children of his own, and his son Commodus became emperor upon his father's death. Commodus, however, was a cruel man who was assassinated by his own troops after 12 years in power. This once again demonstrated the power of the army, but in this case, the power to break emperors. Septimius Severus became emperor after a civil war, and his dynasty, the Severan rulers, would lead Rome for the next four decades, establishing a military monarchy that saw military officers put into civilian government posts, an enlarged army, and higher pay for troops. Once the Severan dynasty came to an end, more instability rocked the empire. From 235 to 284, there were 22 emperors, only two of which died of natural causes. To put this into perspective, from 96 to 180, a period of 84 years, there were only five emperors. Now, in a period of 49 years, there were more than four times as many. The low point of the empire came under the leadership of Valerian, who was captured in battle by the Persians and died in captivity. Additionally, various Germanic groups began testing Rome's borders, and there were parts of the empire that tried to break away and establish themselves as independent kingdoms. The days of political strength and stability had clearly come to an end. Political problems weren't the only things plaguing Rome during the 3rd century. Renewed warfare and disease caused the empire's population to decrease by a third, leading to declining farm production and a collapse of industry. Roman coins began to lose value, and gold was removed entirely from the system. Payments began to be made in goods rather than money, even to soldiers which did not sit well with the army, which became susceptible to would-be emperors promising to pay them in cash if they aided their ascension. All in all, the 3rd century produced a series of crises that Rome would simply not recover from, despite it limping along for roughly another two centuries. It's time for another review. First, the prosperity of the Pax Romana would come to an end in the late 2nd century, coinciding with political problems like the volatile reign of Commodus, the military monarchy of Septimius Severus, and the chaos of the mid-3rd century. Second, warfare and disease began whittling away Rome's population, and coinage became so devalued, payments were beginning to be made in goods rather than money. So much for the political developments of the empire. It's time now to examine the emergence of the West's second monotheistic faith, Christianity. If we wish to understand the development and growth of the Christian faith, we must first look at the larger context in which Christianity emerged. So we'll take a brief moment to examine Roman religion. During the age of Augustus, he believed the various wars and problems that led to the decline and fall of the Republic had also led to a collapse of traditional Roman faith and morality, and he wanted to make reforms to fix that problem. He began by repairing numerous temples that had been damaged or had simply become dilapidated due to negligence. He also sponsored the construction of new temples across the Roman world to give more people access to places of worship. Also, during this time, the cult of Roma and Augustus was established. 
This cult was designed as a celebration of the idea of Rome, as well as that of the emperor. Julius Caesar had already been made a god by the Romans by this time, as would Augustus after his death. And ancestor worship was always important to the Roman people, so this move to create a faith surrounding the emperor should not come as that much of a surprise. The Romans were, as you can see, a polytheistic people, just like nearly everyone we've discussed in these lessons to this point. Polytheistic people tend to be pretty tolerant of other belief systems and gods. If they weren't, things in their society would fall apart pretty quickly. The Romans were no exception to this, allowing people to worship the various gods in the Roman pantheon, the Greek pantheon, and the myriad mystery cults that still existed. Roman faith, just as traditional Greek faith before it, was mechanical and emotionless, based on correctly practiced ritual and properly executed festivals, as I discussed in Unit 5's presentation. This made mystery cults, with their emotional fulfillment, notion of an afterlife, and intense initiation rituals attractive to those wanting more out of their faith. Since Christianity will emerge out of Judaism, it's to the Jewish context we must now turn. Rome had made Judea a province in 6 CE, and there were four different groups of Jews who had different opinions regarding the relationship with Rome. The Sadducees wanted to cooperate with the Romans and favored a very strict interpretation of the Old Testament. The Pharisees wanted to be free from the Romans but advocated peaceful measures to make this happen. They also favored strict observance of Jewish rituals. The Essenes were waiting for a Messiah to come along and usher in paradise, thus freeing the Jews from all forms of oppression. Finally, the Zealots also wanted Judea free from Roman control, but unlike the Pharisees, wanted to use violence to get the job done. It's in this context that Jesus will grow up and begin his ministry. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew who grew up near Galilee. He tried to reassure more conservative Jews that he was not going to undermine their beliefs, but he also said that practicing rituals was far less important than undergoing an inner transformation and becoming a better person due to faith in God. His message also included values such as humility, charity, and love, values that would become important in shaping and reshaping the faith from this point on. Despite his attempts at reassurance, Jesus upset pretty much every stakeholder in Judea. His talk of a spiritual kingdom rather than a real one on this earth disappointed the Zealots. While talk of him being the long-awaited Messiah upset the Essenes, and the Sadducees and Pharisees believed his message would indeed undermine their traditional beliefs and practices. The Romans, meanwhile, disliked all this talk of a kingdom for the Jews, possibly misinterpreting his message as saying he wanted to carve out a real kingdom for Jews out of Roman lands. He was eventually turned over to Roman authorities and crucified by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Days later, some of his most fervent supporters claimed to see Jesus, and this belief that following him would allow for life after death pushed his followers into devoted teachers who traveled the Roman world, preaching Jesus' message to anyone who would listen while constantly having to avoid Roman authorities. Another important figure in early Christianity is Paul of Tarsus. Despite Rome's dislike of Christians, they considered them as just another group of Jews like the Sadducees and the rest. They did not recognize them as a separate faith. Neither did most people in the Roman world. Paul strongly advocated that the message of Jesus be delivered to both Jews and non-Jews, and that everyone should be taught the lessons of Jesus, and efforts should be made to convert anyone and everyone. It was this push to broaden the reach beyond the Jewish people that transformed Christianity into its own faith, separate from Judaism. He also believed that faith in Jesus made salvation for humans possible, despite our original sin. 
Before we continue our examination of Christianity, let's pause here for a short breather and review. First, the Romans were a polytheistic people, worshipping their own deities, those of the ancient Greeks, along with a host of mystery cults. Second, there were four main groups of Jews in the Roman world, each with a different point of view regarding their relationship with the Roman state. Third, Jesus was a Palestinian Jew who preached love, charity, and humility, but angered many and was executed by the Romans. Finally, Paul of Tarsus played a vital role in early Christianity, as it was Paul who argued Christianity should be preached to both Jews and non-Jews. Christianity spread slowly at first, mainly through parents raising their children in the faith rather than through scoring conversions. By 300 CE, estimates are that Christians made up around 2-3% to of the population of the empire, meaning a bit over a million people. In the wake of Jesus' death, Gospels were written that purported to record the events of his life, and these Gospels were combined with letters written by Paul and other texts to form the New Testament. In 66 CE, a Jewish revolt was violently put down by the Romans, who then destroyed the Second Temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE, leading to what's known as the Jewish Diaspora, or the dispersal of Jews across the Mediterranean world. This lack of a central location that could direct the faith meant that Christian communities were essentially on their own and came up with their own solutions to difficulties they faced. This led to a situation where instead of Christianity as a united whole, it's more accurate to speak of many Christianities that were developing, each constructing a slightly different interpretation of the faith than the others. These early Christian communities celebrated the Eucharist, and many had women serving in important roles. Although over time, figures known as bishops, claiming spiritual descent from Jesus' original followers, began to take on more responsibilities and were invariably men. These communities also used Roman infrastructure such as roads and shipping lanes to travel, teach, and establish new communities. After the destruction of Jerusalem, the Romans didn't pay too much attention to the Christians, but over time they began to view them as a dangerous group whose activities could undermine the Roman state. Since Christians were monotheistic, they refused to partake in Roman religious ceremonies, and even more importantly, refused to participate in the cult of Roma and Augustus, which to the Romans meant disloyalty. Additionally, because Christians often practiced their faith in secret, vicious rumors began to swirl about what they did during their ceremonies. Some Romans asserted that they were cannibals, as they claimed to eat the body and drink the blood of their god. Others claimed, with no actual evidence to support this assertion, that Christians kidnapped Roman children to sacrifice them to their god. These rumors and baseless fear-mongering about Christian groups, combined with the suspicions of the Roman state, led to the first persecutions of Christians. Although the persecutions were never as widespread or thorough as later claimed, they were instances in which the Roman state purposefully hurt innocent people simply because they were afraid of the possible implications of their faith. Persecution sometimes backfired, though, as Christians became martyrs for their cause, and some Roman people began to wonder what was it about this faith that caused people to be so calm in the face of death. That wonder at times turned to investigation, which led to conversion. The persecutions also forced Christians to adopt a more centralized structure with clear leaders of these communities who would provide advice and leadership. Christianity did have, however, a number of advantages that allowed it to survive and eventually thrive. First, it looked to most Romans just like other mystery religions they were aware of, so it wasn't so unfamiliar as to instantly turn people off. Also, Unlike many of the other mystery cults, Christianity had a human figure, Jesus, at the center, which made the faith more relatable than cults that had mythical creatures as their deity. Third, 
Christianity promised an afterlife for those who converted and believed, something traditional Roman faith did not provide. Lastly, Christianity was open to all people, man or woman, rich or poor, and was easy to join, not having some expensive or hard to access initiation ritual. Finally, women played a vital role in Christianity's beginnings. As we've already seen, in its early years, women could serve as officials in Christian communities. Over the course of time, however, the faith became dominated by men, who took over the leadership positions such as that of bishop. Women, though, still played an important part even after that, serving as the primary teachers of young children, preachers to non-Christians, and martyrs for the faith. It's time for another review before we get into some cultural developments. First, Christianity grew slowly in the Roman world, mostly through families raising their children in the faith rather than scoring converts. Second, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans scattered Christians around the Eastern Mediterranean, allowing these groups to evolve different beliefs, practices, and answers to important questions about the faith. Third, Roman views on Christians began to sour due to misunderstandings and fear-mongering. Finally, Christianity had built-in advantages that helped it survive, such as having a real person as its deity and looking similar to other mystery cults. Let's leave the religious developments of the empire behind and move into some cultural developments. The army played a huge role in Romanizing the provinces of the empire. Military camps were centers of Latin language, as well as Roman traditions and ways of thinking. Troops, as well as their families nearby, and any enslaved people they owned, needed products and goods, and often wanted Roman versions of them, which led to trade between the military camps and nearby cities, and plugged the camps into the larger trade networks spanning the empire. Additionally, retired troops often stayed in cities nearby their former posts and raised families according to Roman traditions. This last point was aided by a rule that said troops were not allowed to retire back to their home country. They had to settle somewhere else in the empire, a rule which aided in the spread of Romanization. Cities were also vehicles for Romanization. As mentioned previously, the empire relied on local elites and cities to maintain order and collect taxes. Although Rome was the largest city in the empire, the eastern half was home to other large cities like Athens, Alexandria, and Antioch. The western half was not as urbanized as its eastern counterpart, so its cities were fewer in number and smaller in size, but nonetheless important in helping the empire control territory. Because of the lack of urbanization in the West, Romanization proceeded more quickly there than in the East, where many cities dated to before Rome was around and therefore had their own independent, non-Roman traditions and history that they held on to. Roman-built cities all followed the same layout, so just as in the Hellenistic world with its Greek-style cities, a Roman citizen could travel from Spain to Turkey and instantly recognize the plan of the city and figure out where the important buildings would be located. The elites who ran these cities did not get paid, but they did get Roman citizenship for a job well done and enjoyed the power that came from holding office. As officials in the provinces proved their worth to Rome, they began to advance their careers and we see the composition of the Senate became more provincial over time, as fewer Italian men paid attention to politics and ran for office, and men from the provinces gladly filled those seats. The upper class throughout the Roman world were therefore heavily Romanized, as they were the ones Rome tapped to lead cities according to Roman ideals, values, and utilizing Roman laws. The law therefore served as another Romanizing force, during the Republic, theories of civil law, natural law, and the law of nations all developed. Roman jurists during the Empire developed the idea that natural rights implied an equality between all people, that everyone was born equal before the law and should therefore be treated that way, though in reality, this was not the case. 
Roman law also developed important principles that would carry on throughout Western history, such as the idea of innocent until proven guilty, the notion that a guilty person was allowed to defend themselves, and the concept that judges should carefully weigh evidence before coming to a conclusion. Latin literature also played a role in the process of Romanization, particularly among the upper classes who could read. Recall that in Unit 5, I discussed how despite being heavily influenced by Greek culture, the Romans did create unique and original examples of literature. They continued to do so in the Empire. One of the most famous Roman authors, Virgil, connected Rome to the distant past by envisioning his title character, Aeneas, as a survivor of the Trojan War who traveled to Italy and founded Rome. Virgil also claimed that Rome's unique contribution to the world would not be in philosophy or sculpture, but rather in government, and it was thus Rome's destiny to rule over all people. A contemporary of Virgil, Horace satirized his own society, highlighting how weak and foolish human beings can be, but stressing tolerance of that fragility. The poet Ovid, meanwhile, wrote love poems and scandalized many people, Augustus included, with a book dedicated to the art of seducing a married woman. Ovid was banished from Rome after involvement in a sex scandal, possibly involving Augustus' daughter. The historian Livy wrote a history of the Republic that carried on into the Empire. Livy believed history should teach moral lessons, and that we can use examples of past figures to learn from and either emulate or avoid. The following century saw a quality of Latin prose that wasn't quite as good as that which came before, making this literature part of the, quote, Silver Age, as opposed to the first century, quote, Golden Age. Seneca was heavily influenced by Stoic philosophy, while the historian Tacitus wrote a history of the empire, but was more a cheerleader of Roman imperialism and not overly concerned with factual accuracy. For the illiterate masses of people, popular sports like chariot races were a common and uniting distraction. The gladiator shows, though, were the most popular attraction Rome had to offer, and any city worth its salt would have an arena that pitted fighters against one another. The Colosseum in Rome is by far the most fabulous arena the Empire produced. Gladiator shows saw many different types of combat, from two trained gladiators battling, to prisoners being executed, to humans combating various animals, to animals taking on other animals. The Roman people couldn't get enough of the bloodshed in action. The architecture of the Colosseum even allowed the floor to be flooded so small-scale naval battles could be put on. The shows also served important political functions. Not only did they distract poor Romans from their mundane, often miserable lives, they provided an outlet for pent-up aggression and frustration, allowing the people to channel their wrath not at the emperors or other politicians, but at gladiators and other fighters fighting and dying for their entertainment. That's quite a bit of material on culture, so let's take a break and review the main points of this section. First, the process of Romanization was carried out through the army, cities, and the law. Second, Latin literature experienced a golden age under Virgil and Ovid, and a silver age in the following century with writers like Seneca. Third, the masses enjoyed spectacles like chariot racing and especially gladiator shows, which would often pit two different types of gladiators against each other, but also consist of prisoner executions and animal fights. Lastly for today, we cannot have a thorough look at the empire if we don't give a brief mention to social classes, slavery, and women. During the age of Augustus, he tried to limit the decadence of the upper classes as part of his program to reform Roman morals. To that effect, the amount of money that could be spent on lavish feasts was limited, stricter adultery laws were passed, which was more than a bit hypocritical as Augustus himself couldn't seem to follow them, and tax penalties were imposed on those who chose not to have children. 
Under Augustus, Roman society split into three social groups. The first was the senatorial class, which required a person to have one million sesterces worth of wealth to qualify. Those in this class had access to the best political offices available during the empire. The equestrian class contained those with over 400,000, but less than one million sesterces in wealth. These men had access to political offices, but they weren't as good as those the senatorial class had access to. Finally, everyone with under 400,000 sesterces in wealth was part of the lower class, meaning this was a very diverse group economically, encompassing those with hundreds of thousands of sesterces of wealth, as well as dirt poor manual laborers in cities barely scraping by. Slavery still existed in the empire, and was still a sign of wealth and status, just as it had been during the Republic. Enslaved people were still used in a variety of tasks, from agricultural laborers to different types of domestic servants. However, the general tendency to consolidate the empire rather than expand it did cut off the biggest source of enslaved people, that being prisoners of war. Finally, let's take a quick look at the Roman family during the empire. Recall that in Unit 5's lesson, we saw that the family was like a mini-state within a state, with the pater familias having total control over everyone in his household. That absolute power waned during the empire, as the father-husband lost the power to sell his kids into slavery or put them to death. Upper-class Roman women enjoyed even more rights than they had during the Republic. They could now own and inherit property and operate businesses on their own. They still had no political rights, but still had behind-the-scenes influence over powerful husbands. One reason for the tax penalty on not having children passed by Augustus was that the upper classes began having fewer children. Women risked quite a bit during pregnancy, including their lives, so many chose to simply not have children or used various contraceptive or abortion practices to prevent or end pregnancies. Let's do our final review before this presentation comes to an end. First, under Augustus, society was divided into three social classes, the senatorial class, the equestrian class, and everyone else. Second, slavery was still a mark of prestige during the empire, and enslaved people were used in a variety of roles. Finally, though the power of the pater familius waned during the empire, women still did not have official political power or rights, but could exercise behind-the-scenes influence as they had during the Republic. That does it for Unit 6. In this lesson, we've explored how Roman emperors acquired more power. We also saw how Christianity emerged and grew during the Empire. Finally, we examined the various factors behind the Romanization of the Empire and took a brief look at society during this time. As always, if you have any questions about this lesson and you've got a YouTube account, please leave them in the comment section below or send me an email if you're a student. Further, if you're interested in some of the topics covered in this lesson, here's a list of books you can check out. Finally, please keep the comment section clean and don't sully it with the insults of others. Thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you all again in the next video.